Christmas. It's still your big special command performance, and we're still with the big man of the year, Chris Kringle, Mr. Santa Claus. Right here, I think that for our sentimental listeners, we should present a heart clutching song of nostalgia, sung by a lovelorn soul. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Cass Daly singing together. Santa, what's that you're lugging up to the microphone? This, it's a package addressed to the guys and gals at Castle Point and the Birmingham General, and to all the listeners on the bedside nets. And in it, we find a great visitor. Grand guy, marvelous wit, ready raconteur. He's the salt of the earth. You're only saying that because it's true. Jerry Colonna! <laughs> Thank you, one and all, and Merry Christmas. Colonna, what was that? Christmas seals. <laughs> I'll have your hide for this. All right, but I want you with baggy around the knees. <laughs> Jerry, I hear you just did a big show for some boys in the hospital. Ah, yes, indeed. What a show. I did acrobatics, and first I'd lean over backwards and pick up the handkerchief with my teeth. Oh, wonderful. Then for an encore, i pick up my teeth with a handkerchief. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. What a chorus we had with 20 gorgeous girls, all dressed in newspapers. Twenty gorgeous girls dressed in newspapers? Yep. Every time they turned around, you could see what happened to Dick Tracy. Of 
course, the luckiest guy was John B. Hughes with his views behind the news. <laughs> Finale was colossal. Sensational, Ken. Just imagine. Gypsy Rose Lee dressed in a copy of the Chicago Sun. I, I love to see, see that, that evening sun go down. Well, so much for all this stuff, Jerry. I, I just can't get over my excitement. It's, it's Christmas again. Isn't this a wonderful season? Well, frankly, this year it hasn't thrilled me so much. Nope. I got my hands on something I wanted all my life. A big red drum. And then I just couldn't beat it. Well, why couldn't you beat it? Don't tell me the old incentive was lacking. Don't tell me the Christmas spirit was weakening. Even worse, the store detective was watching. Oh. <laughs> Kelowna, you're just one step removed from a moron. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to crowd you. Ah, <laughs> uh, but Santa, I don't know. This year, even, even my tree doesn't look good. Why not? Well, during the summer, it turned brown. Oh. Then, <laughs> then I dug up the uh, holly wreath that Jack Benny sent me last year. What a cheap holly wreath. Needles only played 12 records. <laughs> then my kid brother got arrested for doing his Christmas shopping early. Now, 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 Professor, Professor, how would he get arrested for doing his shopping early? It was too early. Store wasn't even open yet. <laughs> <laughs> then I couldn't think of what to get Rita Hayworth, so I walked around and looked in all the windows. What happened? Harry Khan came out and said, Stop looking in our window. <laughs> The worst thing that happened to me was last week when this carpenter character got me a job. A job at a department store. Well, this sounds excruciatingly interesting. Tell me more. <laughs> yes, tell me more. Please, Jerry. <laughs> tell me more. That'd be costing you, Santa. If you say that once more, I'll have to stop twisting your arm. Oh. <laughs> but if you must know, he found me wandering around the May Company. <laughs> Jerry Colonna. Hiya, Professor. Hello, Ken. What's the matter, Jerry? You look as if you'd been down in the dumps. Yeah, do you know where your present is coming from? <laughs> What's bothering you? Well, frankly, I need some more spending money. Dough, moolah, some Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra? Yeah, some of that long green. Oh. <laughs> I just thought of what I wanted to give Linda Darnell this year. A diamond tiara. A tiara? Yes, it would go so well with her boom de <laughs> Five. Well, I'm sorry, Jerry, but my money's all tied up in cash. Um, I've, um, I've, got, I've got five, but I want to buy my wife that pressure cooker she wants so much. Oh, hand it over, son. She doesn't need a cooker when she's got a pot like you. <laughs> uh, come on, Kenson, and fork it out. Now, huh? look, Jerry, I've got a better idea. I'll get you a temporary job. Now, just follow me. Come on. Job? Kensington, I can't work. I'm delicate. I'm fragile. I'm aesthetic. I'm lazy. <laughs> now, look, Professor, it's only for a couple of hours, and all you got to do is play Santa Claus. The regular one's sick today. Ken, do you think I could really fill his shoes? Well, I don't know about the shoes, but you can certainly fill the throne. <laughs> Come on, Jerry, hurry up. You'll miss the elevator. Face the front, please. Mister, don't press your nose so hard against the glass from the door. I want a case to lay out. Don't worry, I won't break the glass. <laughs> Second floor, household appliances. Third floor, dry goods. Fourth floor, girdle, stockings, and ladies' lounge rags. <laughs> Anyone for band-aids? <laughs> Fifth floor, toy land. Oh, this is for us, Jerry. Let us out. Yes, I'd better see Santa Claus. My, you're big ones, aren't you? <laughs> well, you can tell this is the toy department. The grown-ups are all playing with the toys, and the kids are standing around crying. Oh, Kelowna, here's your new boss now. Oh, how do you do, sir? I'm... Oh, wait a minute. You're the nasty-voiced guy that Jack Benny keeps running into all the time. Are you the manager here? Well, what do you think I am with this gardenia in my lapel? A flower pot? Frank, <laughs> Mr. Colonna, turn around so I can look you over. My, isn't he a chubby one? Hey. <laughs> Mr. Nelson, do you think I'm qualified to take the place of your Santa Claus? Oh, certainly, Mr. Colonna. All he ever does is sit around on his big fat mezzanine. 
And now suppose you step into the dressing room here and try on the suit. Okay. See you later, Ken. Say, I'm fast at this stuff. I have to take off my coat and slap red makeup on my face. Yes. Now I'll put on the beard like this. Yes. Why, Professor, that looks grand. Now, that's the makeup you should have on every one of your personal appearances. Mr. Nelson, this beard is so big, it covers my entire face. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, how does the suit seem to fit? Well, I'm having trouble with the falsy, the, the stomach. <laughs> there, that's it. Pretty fast, eh? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, but, Mr. Colonna, the stomach's supposed to be in front. Oh, my mistake. That's you. <laughs> oh, the pants are so baggy. Yeah, well, Santa, let's off to work. Uh, come, Colonna, don't just sit there. Stand up. Nelson, I am standing up. <laughs> it's the suit that's sitting. <laughs> Never mind. Come along, little man, and I'll lift you up on the throne. Down this aisle? Yes. Ooh, aren't we devils? We're walking around in ladies' lingerie. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. These things are pretty. I want to buy one of these for my girl. Yeah, professor, you can't buy one of those. Well, I... uh, they'll explain <laughs> that. <laughs> well, here's Santa's little corner right up ahead. And look at the eager little kitties. Look who's here, kitties. Oh, my, aren't they charming little cherubs. The one at the front of the line is my little boy, little Rover. Why did you name him Rover? His mother always wanted a dog. <laughs> is he cunning? I'm afraid of him. Does he bite? Oh, no, no. Rover never bites. Then why is he spreading ketchup on my leg? <laughs> <laughs> well, Santa, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go help the store detective. He tell, tells me he caught a beautiful red-headed shoplifter, and I can hardly wait to make a pin. Happy day! <laughs> Congratulations. I'm 34, going on Benzedrine. <laughs> now, let's get on to the quiz, huh? Hey, are you really beloved old Santa Claus? The one and only real honest-to-goodness Santa Claus? Yes. Why, you dirty, no-good rat! What happened to all my loot? Well, <laughs> Promise me a mink coat, a Cadillac, and a diamond ring. So what do I find in my sock? Three lousy, stinking jelly beans. <laughs> what happened to the mink coat, the Cadillac, and the diamond ring? Well, little girl, you don't realize my problems. It's pretty hard to make that iron claw drop in just the right place. <laughs> yeah, why don't you go sit in a mouse trap, you, you big, fat piece of cheese? <laughs> ah, your family owns a bathtub. Yeah, but we never use it. <laughs> Santa, see these scissors? I want to take a souvenir, a pimento, something to identify you by. Oh, a lock of my wavy mustache? You smash my eye. I'm taking a lock of your nose. I... <laughs> that's all. That did it. I just dropped by to see how you're doing with the little angels. How you making out? I'm getting out of here. Oh, you can't quit oh, so yeah. easily, Jerry. Why don't you try your luck with just one more little kid? Try that bright-looking lad. Well, I'm just an impetuous fool. Come here, bright-looking boy. What's your name? Lord, tell me, I'm 12 years old and I went to Hollywood High. <laughs> Well, the Tetley, huh? No kidding. You went to Hollywood High? Yeah, that's why I got expelled. <laughs> Make this fast, Buster. I gotta get over to UCLA to pick up my M.A. Your Master of Arts degree? No, my ma. She's mooped in the sorority house. <laughs> Come on, Buster. Come on. Why the third degree? Where's your warrant? What's the rep? Right, looking boy, you don't understand. I'm Santa Claus. Santa who? Santa Claus. Look. This time of year, who goes flying through the air faster than the speed of sound, whizzing past the chimneys and the red light, zooming over the housetops? A California driver. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kid, you must have some practical idea about what you want. Well, hey, I got it. I got to have a blow toy. A 
Blowtorch. Son, why would you want a blowtorch? All my life I wanted to blame down Muddy Wooly. <laughs> why, what would you like to give me? You mean besides a shot in the head? <laughs> Let's see, I just had an idea. Now, what was it? Uh, oh, yeah, I've got it right in the back of my head. Good for you, Buster. You got a corner. <laughs> I remember. Got it right here. Here you are, son. The perfect tribute. It's an incense burner and a mirror. Hey, what do I do with an incense burner? You burn punk in it. Yeah? <laughs> where do I find the punk? That's where the mirror comes in. <laughs> now, shove off, kids. Scram. Bust your compass. Get lost. Ah, simmer down, egghead. Egghead? See, my features are finally chiseled. Your parents got cheated, too. <laughs> Son, you're exciting me. Ah, oh, pull up your pants. Your pot is boiling over. <laughs> Child, bright-eyed moron. <laughs> Why don't you file off that point on your head? I don't think you should be permitted to have anything sharp. Nelson, I can't take this. this. This kid is getting me down. He's knocking me out. What'll I do? While you're down there, why don't you smoke a Lucky and feel your level bed? <laughs> yeah, Ken, would it be all right if I smoke? No, it'd be funny if you didn't. I just said fire to your pants. <laughs> Jerry, thank you. Here's our good friend, Harry Babbitt. What's that you've got tucked under your arm, Harry? Well, it's a copy of I Remember Mama. Oh. Shall we be on with it? I do. I remember Mama so well Golden hair and voice like a bell, always so neat and sweet as the sweetest rose. I remember Mama so well, and the bedtime story she tells. Till my sleepy eyes would close She had worries, how oh, well I know it Maybe more than you and I There were tears, but she'd never show it Guess that angels never cry And sometimes when dreams would go astray She would hold me in her arms and say Don't worry, my darling, don't worry can never, never forget. Oh, 
contribution to our Christmas command. Well, are you ready with any more presents for the gang? Yes, but uh, can you know, I've been bothered all day by a fellow in a baggy suit. And I see his head poking out of my bag right now. Well, oh, my gosh, Santa. That's a good friend of the gang. Oh? He's tops with Armed Forces Radio. Oh, well, come here, my good man. Now, who, who are you? You me, 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 me. I'm a general, uh, colonel, uh, 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 I'm glad to meet one of the Army's finest brains. <laughs> tell me, tell me something, Sack. What would the men overseas like me to give them more than anything else? Oh, uh, well, they like a uh, bee, a uh, bee, a uh, bee, uh, they, they like a uh, bee, uh, they, they like to play to ch check, it's, 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 well, you see, they, 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 they like to see art museum, art museum. Send him a dame. <laughs> well, what, uh, what if I run over and see the boys? Oh, sure, they, they'll be happy to discuss their uh, uh, philosophy. Uh, uh, they, 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 oh, uh, they, they'll be glad to talk about Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. Uh, oh, uh, they'll play to ch check it. Uh, uh, go ahead, but bring a dame. <laughs> They're not in the army anymore. He's not? No, they're particular now. Oh. Uh, Sack, uh, what are you doing for a living these days? <laughs> Making perfume. <laughs> for what company? Well, yeah, the best. Evening and evening and Chanel number. I'm raising a stink of my own. <laughs> I see, Secky, I see. Yeah, well, well I'm, I'm busy all day uh, putting caps on my perfume bottles. Oh. Caps, yeah. Yes, caps. You're economical, are you? Oh, yes, oh, I'm conservative. Yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, 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 say, uh, I'm very, uh, 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 I'm keeping my business out of other people's noses. <laughs> Good for you. Now, tell me something, Sack. What would you like me to get you for Christmas? Oh, well, I, I like a baby, a baby, a baby, uh, uh, yeah, some warm under will be, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, no, 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 I, I, I like some laundry, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I want a kiss from a gorgeous dame. <laughs> Good. Well, Sack, I have one right here. And Southern. And... Do you know the sack? Oh, certainly. How are you, sacky, honey? Wait, wait, just a minute. Now. Don't get, don't get so excited over this babe, sack. She's just a woman like your mother. <laughs> there she is. Yes. Yeah, but we, we, we was wrong. <laughs> And tell me, would you consider kissing the sad sack? Why, of course, Santa. Sacky, have you ever had a girl alone? Well, uh, 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 of course not. I, I, I was an honorable soldier to dear so uh, well, uh, I'm a gentleman, a gentleman, uh, I'm a gentleman. I'm a gentleman. I'm stupid. <laughs> Take a girl out to get at Griffith Park. Oh, why, Sacky, I'm shocked. What did you do? We in the net and the net and the net and we uh re ref uh re ref uh we we made the la 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 uh uh we we played gin rummy. Oh now Sack. That's a child's game. Yeah? Yeah we with real gin? Oh, 
was for your kiss. Now close your eyes and tuck a rug. Oh, boy, here's where I get a free harmonica lesson. <laughs> Uh, this looks very interesting. I, I think I'll move in on this myself. Uh, uh, come on, Anna. P- p- pucker up. Uh, this time I'll g- 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 give you my high uh, for this low one. Hmm. Here, here. <laughs> here, here. Wait a minute, Jack. Wait a minute. You don't want to kiss Anna again? Well, you're right, Santa. It, it's a uh, child. It, it's, 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 it's infant. <laughs> the heck I don't. She's wonderful. <laughs> no, no, no. Now, look here, Jack. Anne may look gorgeous and desirable to you, but she's really not. No, it's all in your mind. Your mind is making a fool of you. <laughs> it, 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 it is? Yes. Just the same thing about kissing, you know. Kissing is all in your mind. Your mind's making a fool of you. It, 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 uh, it is? Certainly it is. <laughs> oh. Certainly. <laughs> yes, yes, and you... You know, you don't really enjoy kissing Anne. Again, your mind is making a fool of you. You understand? Yeah, I, I, I sure do. Uh, well, come here, Anne. Oh, I'm ready, lover boy. <laughs> well, Sack, Sack, now wait. Hey, Sacky! Didn't you hear my advice? What about your mind making a fool of you? <laughs> There's the Santa. Shake hands with an idiot. <laughs> I know the air transport service will like it too. A song from the Pied Pipers. Christmas time is the old stories it brings to mind. We'd like to tell you a particularly beautiful one tonight through the words of a distinguished Hollywood cast, including Francis X. Bushman, William Conrad, Jeffrey Silver, Jane Webb, and our star, our dear old friend, the man who handed me my Academy Award, Donald Crisp. (laughs) 
Command Performance presents this one brief moment starring Mr. Donald Crisp as narrator. For some there are who seek to reach a goal, and some who scoff and look away with scorn. But still the seekers make their way until in one brief moment it is then revealed how great the quest, how wonderful the goal. Now hear the story told on Christmas Eve in Antwerp, where the North Sea meets the Skelet. The story of a boy, a dog, a dream, that did not fade but lives today as proof that faith and charity shall never die. League from Antwerp, there lay a town amid the pasture lands so flat and green, where lines of alder trees and poplars too were sentinels which lined the great canal that glided through the center of the town. And close beside an ancient mill that worked with slowly moving arms, there stood a hut, a humble little place but sparkling clean. And here, Old Yehan Das had made his home, a man who once had lived a soldier's life, but now could only do such simple tasks as taking milk to Antwerp, to be sold for those few people of the town who helped the old man to earn a livelihood. It was in a cart he bore the cans of milk, and at his side to lend him aid there walked his grandson, Nello. So it was one day that Yehan Das and Nello took the road to Antwerp. Quickly walked the boy, as bright anticipation filled his stride. Uh, how long the way to Antwerp has become, and such a heaviness has filled the cart. You shouldn't leave the village, Grandpa Das, uh, for you have not the strength that once you had. But I am young and strong and much more fit to travel thus upon the Antwerp road. Yeah, but young and healthy though you are, my son, I fear these cans would be too much to pull for you alone. Oh, I do not think that I... <sighs> Come, let us pause. But I must rest a spell before we travel on. Well, we shall pause. What means this great impatience in your voice, son? And why do lines of sadness creep your brow? Come, Nello. Tell me why this sudden haste. It is nothing, Grandpa Dyer. It soon will pass. Uh, but what is there in Antwerp that draws you thus? The ringing bell. It is that which bids me come. The great cathedral bell which calls to prayer. I want to see the paintings hanging there. The Master Rubens' greatest works of art. But Nello, child, you know as well as I that only those of wealth can draw the bells which hide the treasured frames. Then I shall pay. With what? The little money we earn thus by taking milk to Antwerp town is dross. A paltry sum which barely buys us food. I'll get the money somehow, Grandpa Dad. Oh, it's best that you forget your cherished dreams. For we are poor. And yet must thankful be that we are given bread and cheese to eat and can afford the hut we call our home. It is not right that one should be so poor he cannot pay to see beneath the veils. He didn't mean the poor should never see. He would have had to see them every day. I wish that I were as rich as Boss Kogas and owned the mill as prosperous as his. Then I could surely pay to draw the veil. Uh, forget the wealth of Miller Boss Kogas, for such a wealth will never come to you. And listen to me, Nello. Hear my words. It is better you forget his daughter, too. Forget his daughter, Eloise? But why? You know the miller bears you naught but scorn and sees you as a beggar dressed in rags. Oh, we are friends. What matters how I live or how my clothes are worn? Eloise is fond of me, and I am fond of her. Yeah, but you shall always live in poverty until the day you die. Oh, I shall be rich. 
Perhaps not now. One day soon I'll be. <laughs> You're still a dreamer, child. Where two can tell, perhaps your dreams may one day all come true. They will. Give me your hand and help me to rise. My arms and legs have once more found their strength. And it's time that we were on our way. <clears throat> ah. Then I'll take the other shaft and let us go. No, oh, it's wrong that we must live this way. Hold fast your hope. For as the good book says, how blessed in spirit are the poor, my son. For heaven's kingdom surely will be there. I know the words, but... What's wrong, my child? I heard a cry. An animal in pain. A far-off bird. <clears throat> no, there it is again. Why, I hear it now. Where, where, where can the creature be? I do not know. Somewhere near this place. I see it now flying in the ditch. Oh, a dog. Badly beaten, I would say. Uh, how thin it is. Uh, we cannot leave it there. Yeah. Put him in our car. Uh, uh, uh. But gently, child. This master must have kicked and beaten him. And left him by the roadside there to die. We'll take him home and nurse him back to health. And could I keep him for my very own? I always treat him kind. Then he shall stay. And now, my son, we must be on our way. And thus the dog Patrashi found a home. And tenderly they cared for him each day until at last the dog was well again. And then Patrashi showed his gratitude to Yihan, Das, and Nello. For one day, when they came out to get the little cart, the dog was lying there between the shafts, as though to say, now I shall pull the load. They tried to move him, but he wouldn't budge. And so they got a harness for the dog, and every day he proudly drew the cart along the Antwerp road. And now it was the old man stayed at home and rested there, while Nello and Patrashi went their way. And daily Nello made his pilgrimage within the sacred portals of the church in hope that someone rich might come to pray and would perhaps draw back the heavy veil so that he might see the master's wondrous work. This love of art was Nello's soul, his life. For reared in poverty, untaught, ignored, he had the compensation or the curse, which we call genius. No one knew of it, and Nilo less of all. There was but one, the dog, for trashy. Seeing Nello draw with chalk upon a stone, a piece of wood, and noticing how radiance lit his face, it was only he that knew the blessed gift bestowed upon the boy. Oft it was that Nello and the dog would seek a spot within the flowered fields about the town. And here the miller's daughter, Alohis, would come and sit with Nello while he drew. And thus it was one day at summer's end, the miller's daughter sat upon the ground, the dog put Trashy's head upon her lap. And on a piece of wood of smoothest pine, which was his only canvas, Nello sketched and drew their likenesses with a charcoal stick. How slow you are, and how my muscles ache with all this spitting. Are you almost done? <laughs> Have you no shred of patience, oh, Louise? Of course it will be done before you know. No doubt you've painted me as some old hag, the one who gathers kindling by the road. I have not pictured you an ugly hag. How good of you. But if you must complain, I shall draw a blue-eyed squealing pig. <gasps> You hear his words, Patrashi? Can it be that you would let him speak to me like that? <laughs> <laughs> you see, Patrashi is my faithful friend, and he knows what is good and what is bad. And he shall judge my drawing. Hello, Ed. My father called. Oh, Nello, leave me now before he finds us here. I will not go, for I have done no wrong. Oh, Nello, please, you know how angry father will become. I will not go, no matter how he wraps. So, here you are. 
Did you not hear me call? I heard you, Father. I was on my way. Your mother needs your help. Yes, Father. Well? I beg you, Father. Nello did no wrong. I sat here with Petrachi by my side while Nello drew my likeness. That is all. I said your mother needs you. Father, please. If you don't leave this instant, Eloise, then I shall find some punishment for you. You needn't be so frightened, Eloise. Petrachi's here. No harm will come to me with him close by. I think you'd better go. Goodbye, then, Nello. We shall speak again. Now, young man, I wish a word with you. <laughs> Nello, it is time that you should realize just how I feel about your meeting with my daughter, Eloise. We did no wrong. What do you call it wrong for her to watch me draw? For her to watch you draw? <laughs> and so it's an artist's fame you seek, huh? To be a Rubens, Jordans, or Van Eyck. Now, here's my advice to you, and heed it well. For better that you seek for lesser things and drive such great ambition from your mind. Remember this, you wear a beggar's coat. And with these painters' fancies, you become a fool. A beggar you will always be, so cast aside that brush. You tell me this, and yet how little do you understand? You laugh at me and ridicule my work. But still you've not seen what I can do. You know, this, this portrait which I did of Eloise. Oh, very well. I'll see this work of art. Ah. <clears throat> Tis folly, as I said, a waste of time, but it is like my daughter, Eloise, and will perhaps be pleasing to my wife. So uh, uh, take this piece of silver for the thing, though I'm losing money on the sale. No, keep your money. And the portrait, too. I'll take it. But my feelings have not changed. I do not want you seeing, Eloise. My daughter's future is my main concern, and in it, poverty shall have no place. Remember that, or you will sorry be. I'm not a I am but a fool. I could have seen them with that silver piece. And yet, her portrait I can never sell. But someday I'll bring honor to my name, and poverty shall give its place to fame. <laughs> Antwerp every year there was announced a contest, open then to every youth of 18 years or less who would attempt with some unaided work in black and white to win the prize which was 200 francs. Now Nello had a secret from the world. It was in a little barn close by the hut that he had fashioned out of roughest wood an easel. Here where no one ever came upon a sea of paper sketched the lad the many fancies which possessed his brain. No colors, bright nor brushes could he buy. Thus he could only fashion what he saw in black and white. And so it was, he drew a simple work which spoke of greatness. There upon the paper he had drawn a man, a woodman seated on a fallen tree, a lonely figure, weary and alone, with night descending darkly over all. And in the figure he had clearly shown the stamp of age, the utter weariness, the quiet patience, and the careworn look, the meditation and the emptiness. And Nello struggled far into the night to bring perfection to this favored sketch. <laughs> Last the drawing was complete. And then one early morn as cold December came, young Nello placed his picture in the cart and took it to a place in Antwerp town, where it would soon be put with all the rest until the choice was made on Christmas Eve. It was with a silent prayer he left it there. Then started back home, but on the way he found a little puppet in the snow. And thinking of Alohis might like the doll, he changed his course to pass the miller's house. I know I'm wrong for Crashy coming here. Or should we be discovered near the mill and lower his anger would descend like rain upon our head? Be still, Patrashy, still. I'll call up to her window. Eloise! came to give this little doll to you. A doll? I found it lying in the snow. 
Wait there and I'll bring it up to you. I know. Please don't try and climb up here. You'll hurt yourself. Be careful lest you fall. Well, here I am. I hope you like your doll. Oh, lovely, Nella. See how great she is with all her dainty petticoats and lace. I had to bring it to you, Eloise, so I could share its loveliness with you. But now I think you'd better leave before someone discovers you up here. If Father ever sees you, it's too late. Too late? Your father. <gasps> Nella, you come down. Oh, Nella. Don't be frightened, Eloise. And just what are you doing near the mill? I came to bring a gift to Eloise. She doesn't need your gifts. Yes, Boss Colgan. I've told you I don't want you near my house. I have to tell you one more time, you'll wish that you'd obeyed. Now take your dog and go. Come on, the trashy. Go. And don't come back. That night there was a fire at the mill. And though the mill itself remained untouched, a quantity of corn was soon destroyed. Far from near the people came and stayed until the fire had been quenched. Was then the miller sought to place the blame and spoke of Nello as the guilty one. For had the boy not loitered near the mill and for the miller borne a hated grudge since he had been warned away from Halloween? Though Bascogius did nothing to the boy, suspicion spread throughout the little town. Then less and less the little cart was seen along the Antwerp road. For none there was who dared to help the boy and thus displeased the rich, important miller, Baskojet. The days grew cold, the snow grew deeper still, and then one night the aged Yehan Das, so ill and tired, passed away. with none to offer comfort in their grief. The time dragged on for Nello and the dog. The little Flemish town grew gay and bright and filled with childish laughter every day for Christmas week had come to bring it cheer and great was the excitement to behold. But Nello felt no touch of happiness as hopefully he looked toward Christmas Eve, the day when he would surely win the prize. And now at last it came, and through the falling snow the anxious Nello walked into Antwerp town, took his place with the other lads within the public square, and then at noon, the great cathedral bell began to ring and Nello's heart was pounding in his breast as high above the heads of all the crowd was held for all to see the winning sketch. And then the winner's name was loudly called. The prize is won by Stefan Kieslinger. <laughs> Clouds of deep despair filled Nello's brain. His dreams came crashing down about his head. Now all was gone for trashy. All was lost. The snow was falling fast. The wind was cold as Nello turned his back upon the square. With faithful old Petrashi at his side, unconscious of the storm, he turned his steps to where the great cathedral stood silent. The portals lay unclosed, the massive doors like outstretched hands of blessed sacrament bade Nello welcome. Up the aisle he went and struggled slowly toward the chancel gates with leaden steps. His eyes were filled with tears, his heart was bursting with an aching throb. Patrashi followed close behind the boy. A whine escaped his lips as if to say, how could you think that I would forsake you now, when more than e'er before you need a friend? With effort, Nello reached the chancel gates, and in despair he fell upon the stones. What more is left for me upon this earth? Things I love are all denied to me. 
Men have no need of me. I'm alone. Except for you, the trashy, faithful friend. How tired I am. How tired of everything. Come. Come let us lie down together here. Let's sleep. They lay together in the piercing cold. The northern winds, they blew like waves of ice. Froze every living thing that fury touched. And in the vault of stone, the bitter chill drew closer still to Nello and the dog. Beneath the veil paintings, there they lay, and smoothed to slumber by the numbing cold. Then suddenly a great white radiance came streaming through the vastness of the aisles and fell upon the paintings overhead. And as the light in brilliance brighter grew, an unseen hand drew back the heavy veils and bared the canvases for all to see. One painting showed Christ Jesus on the cross. The other canvas pictured the descent. Then Nello rose and stretched his arms to them with tears of ecstasy upon his face. The trashy. I have seen them both at last. <clears throat> oh, God, it is enough. Then suddenly, the radiance grew dim, and then was gone. Once more, the darkness hid the face of Christ. Then Nello's arms grew close about his dog. Tis done, and we shall see his face again, and he shall never part us now. And on the morn, there lay there cold and still, while overhead the face of Christ looked down. And as the day drew on, two people came. The first, a girl who clutched a little doll. Oh, no. Can't you hear the Christmas bells? The Christ child's hands are full of gifts for thee. Please, Nello, won't you wake and come with me? And then there came an old, hard-featured man who saw the look of peace on Nello's face. How harsh I was. How cruel to the lad. Now to him I would have made amends that he indeed to me could be a son. Why did he have to die? Who were I the one? At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily, I say unto you, Except ye become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. desperately to attain a goal, lasting peace among nations, Christmas shows us where peace and goodwill can be found. It lies in the faith and innocence of children, untouched by selfishness or prejudice. If the quest is to be completed, if the goal is to be reached, let us consider the example set by the children in the world. For the only international understanding today belongs to children and to Christmas.
wonderful. And so we capped the climax, tousled the tinsel, and wound up with another huge Christmas command. And uh, what say we thank the fine fellow who played Santa Claus for us, Edmund Gwen. Oh. Well, that's grand of him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Edmund, I understand we're all going to join in and sing Jingle Bells. Oh, that's right, Ken. Oh, but first... Yeah? Uh, first, I like that that cute fella, that b b b b Mel Blanc so well. That, uh, <laughs> you oh, you know. mean Sad Sam? Yes, yes. I'd like him to send Christmas greetings from us to the gang. Well, that's easily arranged. Come here, Mel. Yeah? Uh, just say Merry Christmas to the boys. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> well, all right, folks, come on, here we go. Speaking, this program was arranged with the aid of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Uh -huh.